Good morning. Uh, it's time to get in the Word, and uh, I'm glad you are joining us and part of this little thing we do every week. Um, every Friday, I try to, every Friday, um, get in the Word, uh, go through a couple chapters together in the Word. We're actually just finishing the book of Acts, which is a lot of fun. I love this book, and uh, I, I love just uh, going through it uh, together with you. I appreciate you guys uh, jumping in here um, today through the week, and um, so welcome on board. We're in uh, Acts chapter 27. This is the end of Acts. It, it's interesting because Paul is going to get on a boat here as a prisoner, and um, a few minutes later in the book, in the reading, a long, long time later uh, for them, uh, they get back on a boat after a shipwreck, and the circumstances are drastically changed. Um, it went from Paul being just a passenger, a prisoner, to Paul being the captain of the boat, and you'll see that as this unfolds. Anyhow, it's kind of fun. So let's take a look at this. We're in chapter 27 of the book of Acts, and um, we'll go through this, and if we have time, which I think we will, we'll get on through the end of the book of Acts, uh, where we have Paul in Rome, uh, in his own rented home, and continuing to do what he does. Because Paul was consistent. I love the consistency of Paul um, just over time. But what you see in this is, is we've seen him, Paul the evangelist, Paul, you know, going, Paul the persecutor first, of course, and Paul the evangelist going out reaching a lot of people with the message of the gospel. Then coming back, wanting to share the message with his own people in Jerusalem, and, um, and Paul then goes from the evangelist, the, the persecuted the evangelist, to the prisoner. And for a couple of years, he's just kind of a, a political hockey puck, just doing whatever people want, or kind of being led by these different leaders, um, or kept by them, until finally he appeals to Rome. And now he goes as a prisoner on board this ship. And, and I love what you see in this, is what happens to someone who's a believer in God, a believer in Christ, a follower of Christ, um, in different circumstances of their life. How, what's that look like for the persecutor? What's that look like for the, the, uh, the evangelist, the proclaimer? What's that look like for the, the uh, prisoner? And all along the way, what I, I love in this is how you see God just using uh, this uh, humble man who submitted to him. One of, one of my greatest joys, uh, or that brings me a lot of joy, I should say, is when I travel, um, just to see how God connects along the way with people. Specific people, not anyone I look to seek out, or at least I look to, to reach, but along the way we'll often, you know, maybe a few days apart or even a week apart, but God will send someone across our path and you know it's just a divine connection, both for them and for us. And that's what I see God do uh, with people who love him, whose lives are submitted to them, is he wants to use us. And he will use us in all the circumstances of life. And sometimes it's in the very storm itself that tr your true metal of a man or woman is tested and revealed. Is how they respond in gunfire, under gunfire. And we'll see it, various responses during this um, saga at sea. So chapter 27, verse 1, let's uh, pray first. Father, thank you for the word of God. Or no matter the man who proclaims it, the word of God is still the word of God. Even when Satan spoke it, it was the word of God. And you just, <laughs> of course, if Satan speaks it, we know that it's always with a twist. And so, God, thank you, though, that, that we can trust your word. We pray that you just empower the delivery, that the Holy Spirit would be part of this. That even in, in a story of a man's life, and how you intervene, Lord, even in the story that we can see, and maybe even more powerfully see how you work in our lives, Lord. So, God, we thank you. We give you this day. Amen. Chapter 27, verse 1 of the book of Acts. And when it was decided that we should sail for it Italy, they delivered Paul and some other prisoners to a centurion of the Augustan cohort, named Julius. It's interesting that Luke names this centurion. A lot of times the centurion's um, names are not given, but he names this centurion. Um, and you have to think that after their experience together, 
these two, you know, experiences, difficult experiences can really explode relationships or it can knit people together. I think, I suspect that Julius was a lifelong fan of Paul and of all of his whole story after this event that they shared together. I think that there would be something special between them and between him and Luke even, but he says that this person, uh, uh, was a centurion of the Augustan cohort. That was a specific name of his um, group that he led. And uh, so they put him in charge. And embarking in a ship uh, from this place called Edromitium, which is about to sail to the ports along the coast of Asia, we put to sea. So they're going to do some little puddle jumpers, just, you know, where's the ship? We need, we've got a lot of prisoners we've got to put on board, and then we've got to get them to a destination, ultimately to Rome. But this one will serve our purpose because it first takes us up to uh, the south coast of Turkey, or what they called Asia. And so um, it was about to sail to the ports along the coast of Asia. And so we put to sea accompanied by Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica. This was a guy that joined Paul, um, remember, when he came down uh, from those regions. He came down to share with his people. And um, he's now back with Paul, and perhaps he stayed with him all through that uh, imprisonment. Um, faithful man, it's interesting to see him show up again here, Aristarchus. And so Aristarchus, and of course Luke, because Luke is going to tell this through his eyes, firsthand edition of what happened. And so we put to sea, accompanied by Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica. The next day we put in at Sidon, so they sailed all day or all night, um, arrived at uh, Sidon, or maybe not all day, but anyhow, they s s went up the coast a little bit, put in at Sidon, and Julius, and this shows you something about the character of this centurion, he said, Julius treated Paul kindly. Already, as a centurion, he's he doesn't... Um, I've worked uh, within the prison system uh, for a number of years, and the correctional officers can take a lot of different positions as far as the prisoners go. Some can be really just not nice and, and almost feel like it's their job to make it hard on these people. And so they seek to, to make their lives tough. And they're not well liked by the prisoners, I can tell you that. But some do that. Some are just, they're firm but fair. You never get, you know, any flex with them, but they're fair and the prisoners respect that. And then some are just genuinely love the prisoners uh, the inmates and, and are trying to help them out to the degree they can within their position. And then I suppose it could go even farther where some are just too malleable and they probably shouldn't be in that position. But uh, this centurion was, I think, one of those former kind that, that didn't feel like it was his job to inflict on the prisoners more pain than they already had. And so when they get to this place, he knew something, I'm sure, about Paul and that Paul was a political prisoner and so not a flight risk. He let him go. He said, go see your people, you know, go hang out with them. This would be the last shot there for them. And so um, they, he treated Paul kindly. He gave him leave to go to his friends and be cared for. And then putting out to sea from there, from Sidon, which is on the northern, north of uh, Israel or of Tel Aviv and going north that way. Um, Sidon and uh, Julius, let's see, and putting out from there, we sailed under the lee of the island of Cyprus, so they, they kind of coasted along that, but the lee would be out of the wind, which is uh, because the winds, he says, were against us. So it's interesting, uh, Luke uses a lot of nautical terms along the way. Some of them, um, there's uncertainty on exactly what uh, they're speaking of because he's speaking of ship's tackle on different parts of the ship, but obviously this was from the point of view of someone who truly experienced this, not just someone sitting on land writing about sailors at sea. This guy experienced, uh, he had this experience. If you get a chance, look at Psalm 107. There's a passage in there that talks about the merchant that goes out to sea, and they see the wonders of God in the deep. And by that, what he means is they almost die. Um, it gets horrific, and they're on these ways, and this storm, and they're out of control. And then God brings them, it says, into their desired haven, and they're glad, and they rejoice. And he says, in that case, they should uh, fellowship, they should rather take an offering to the temple and say thanks to God. They need to put some feet to what they just experienced, not just be foxhole Christians. But they set out, the winds are against them, Luke is describing this, and um, 
when we had sailed along the open sea, uh, the uh, along the, uh, across the open sea along the coast of Cilicia and Pamphylia to the south of uh, Turkey or Asia, we came to Myra in Lycia. And there, so that's where the boat was headed, and from there the centurion found another ship. Um, it was from uh, African port Al Alexandria, and it was sailing for Italy. So he finds this, and he now needs to transfer the prisoners to that. So on this boat will be a cargo of grain um, going to Italy, the prisoners and the sailors. However many that number would be, the sailors would, would be the mi minority there. Prisoners, the majority, apparently. But we, from later on, it says there were 276 persons in the ship. It was a lot of prisoners and sailors all thrown together in the ship. So he finds this ship, and um, we put us on board. And then verse 7, we sailed slowly for a number of days and arrived with difficulty off Sinidus. As the wind did not allow us to go further, we sailed under the lee of Crete off Salmon, coasting along it with difficulty. We came to a place called Fair Havens, near which was the city of Lycia, which Fair Havens apparently was one of those things. It's a name to attract customers, but it's truly not what it, it says it is. It wasn't a Fair Haven. It wasn't the best port, especially to winter over it. But this was, it's later in the year, there's, they're having difficulty moving around. I don't know how many of you have done, uh, worked on boats. Um, deadliest catch might be a picture of the, the dangers of sea. But even in the inside waters around here, sometimes we get a little beat up just going from point A to B. That's maybe four, six, 12 hour drive ride um, where you're beating the waves or getting beat up by the waves. Um, and that's hard. That would be a squall. Um, these guys are not in a squall, they're in a tempest, and Luke describes it as no small tempest. And they're not just in a no small tempest, they're going to be in this no small tempest for 14 days. It's like it never ends. And if you've ever been in a situation like this where it's horrific for a few moments or hours, you lose track of time. And you begin to, your whole existence is just surviving the next five minutes or hours. And this is exactly what you find Paul in the midst of. This is going to be a demonstration of the character of the men on board this boat. And so, um, oh, we haven't got to that part yet though. So since uh, they came to this place, uh, Fair Havens on the island of Crete. So you have Cyprus close to Israel, then you have Crete. Um, a little farther out south of, uh, south and a little west, I believe, of Turkey and, and south and a little east of, uh, of uh, Italy. So, but it's, it's some distance south and just in the middle of nowhere in a sense. And so they hit this uh, port called Fair Havens, uh, which was near the city of Lycia. And so now you're going to see some decisions made and how they're made and how, um, how that affects the life going forward. So verse 9, since much time had passed, so it took them a long time to get there just because the conditions were bad and deteriorating. It's like our, well, their September, October, these are not good months to be on the water. Um, it can be really nasty. And same thing there, if not more so. And so much time had passed. The voyage was now dangerous because even the fast was already over. That would be the uh, the Day of Atonement, um, that series of holidays, the day of uh, Rosh Hashanah, the head of the New Year, and then uh, the Day of Atonement, Feast of Trumpets, all those things are kind of lined up. But it was after that time, which means it was basically late in the this travel season. It was too late in the travel season. And so since it was now dangerous and the fast was already over, Paul advised them. And this is almost, it's almost laughable if you think about it, you know, from the perspective of the centurion, the owners, the people on the boat, the prison, the soldiers, even the other prisoners, is they're sailing, here's a prisoner among many prisoners headed to Rome, possibly for execution, who knows, and they get to this place and he says, hey guys, I've got an idea, let's don't go any farther. He speaks up and he basically gives them advice. And you'll see what they think of his advice. And so he says, Paul advised them, giving advice to 
Paul wasn't a sailor, but he'd been on boats a few times, right? In fact, we'll find out in Corinthians that this is Paul's third shipwreck, and that Paul has suffered the effects like a night and a day swimming around in the ocean because of a shipwreck. Paul has some experience, but he's not, a sail he's not a sailor, and he's not the pilot of the boat or the owner of the boat. So he says, sirs, to the group, I perceive that the voyage will be with injury and much loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. Paul knew something, and he's speaking that out to them. Now look at how they respond. It's interesting because I think that we can sometimes respond similar um, you know, someone gives advice or counsel from God's word uh, or, or that they've drawn in, from walking with God. And the response is, what the heck do you know? Or, you know, let's take a poll and see who else feels like this. Look at how they respond to his advice. This is good advice. And here's what I've found often is that when God gives advice to me, he, it's never shouted or rarely shouted. You know, of Jesus, it said his voice wasn't going to be heard in the street in the sense that he wasn't like one of those hawkers, you know, those people that are that are just barking out, hey, you know, get your, you know, newspaper, three cents for a dozen or, you know, whatever it is. Right. He's not going to be like that on the street. And often I believe God speaks to us. You see him speaking to uh, Elijah, remember? Elijah had a bad series of days, was super depressed, goes out, there's this, up to this mountain, there's a fire, there's a wind, the brocks are breaking in pieces. And after all that stuff, it says there was a still, small voice of God. It was a very quiet, calm voice. Maybe you had to lean in a little to hear. And I think it would do us good sometimes to lean in to hear God's voice, instead of being attracted to those things that shout the voice of God to us, because it's not really the nature of God to shout. It's the nature of God to speak, unless he's writing out in triumph over his enemies, and that's in Psalms. Um, so it says here that Paul simply said, he stated the case, and then verse 11, the centurion had to make a decision. He could make a decision about this on this. And so listen how he based his decision. The centurion paid more attention to, one, the pilot. The guy who navigates the ship knows most what it can do, right? He knows, you know, the weather. He can read those things. You'll see later the sailors have a premonition. They have a, a sense, and that pilot would have a sense of what this boat could do and what it could handle, and even in these conditions, what could, what could go. And then the second one, it says, was the owner. Um, some versions have the pilot and the owner being the same person, but either way, it's two positions. One is, has to do with your knowledge of the capability of the ship and of your ability as a, as a sailor. Second has to do with the, the ship itself, the welfare of the ship. You own that welfare, and so it's, welfare, so it's sort of your call, right, to send it out and the risk. You're weighing the risk of loss. You don't want to lose the ship. And so the pilot's advice, the ship owner's advice, and he listened to that more than Paul. So that was the first two things. Second was, is the harbor was not suitable to spend the winter in. Um, and I wonder how many people have made bad decisions based on the harbor that they're in. They're thinking, I don't like this harbor. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be very inconvenient. I'm going to have to go out and check the boat and pump the bilge every day for the whole winter. That's a hassle. It's a pain. I can't wait that long. Let's get to a better harbor. And, and you'll see that that was part of the choice. You know, so the pilot, the guy who says he knows about the ship, the owner of the ship, the person who has the most to lose, um, the harbor being not commodious, not a good place to, to say, wasn't suitable to spend the winter in. And then the majority, the majority of people, or the majority of opinions of people, you know, it's, it's interesting how easy it is to get support for a bad opinion or a bad idea. Um, but that could happen. And especially depending on who you're walking with, Psalm 1 says, Bless this man that does not walk or stand in, walk in, the, stand in the path of sinners, walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Let me reverse that. Bless this man that does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, stand in the path of sinners, or sit in the seat of scoffers. In other words, your, uh, your advisory group, what kind of people are they? Because that makes a big difference. And apparently in this case, the majority cited against Paul in their decision. 
And so the um, majority is the fourth thing decided to put out to sea from there on the chance that somehow they could reach Phoenix and, and you know, you could almost make that another thing in this mix is we're going to put out and we're going to take what comes. We're going to launch out and just see how it goes um, against good advice. And so they, uh, their hope was to reach another harbor just around the corner called Phoenix. So they were traveling uh, clockwise around the island of Crete. That was their intention. That somehow they should re reach Phoenix, a harbor of Crete, which faced southwest and northwest. So the, the prevailing winds wouldn't uh, hit it so, so harshly. So then, okay, so that's the first stage, making the decision, you know, having leaning towards a decision or towards a response. And now's the time to make the response, and we'll see the, con the response and the consequences. But first of all, the response is often very much like this, I found, um, in bad decisions. Um, now, when the south wind blew gently, supposing they'd obtained their purpose, they weighed anchor and sail. This isn't that the way it goes. It's, it's so inviting. Look out at the water. It's just flat, calm. Um, I, I have a conversation with one of the guys in our church who went up to Haines uh, last week, or to Skagway, uh, and it was, I remember the morning, it was very nice, very calm, but coming back wasn't so good. And uh, I think they had to beat waves a little bit uh, to get back, but we're going to talk about that. But they looked out, the south wind was blowing gently, so just, you know, flat, calm, little ripples on the water, and they thought they'd obtain their purpose. And so they weighed anchor, which means they pulled it up, and they sailed along Crete, close to the shore. And they're like, uh, and I, you can just see the captain, the owners, people looking at Paul. It's like, hey, what do you think now, pretty boy? You think it's not so bad, is it? We know our stuff. You know, trust us. And um, so... Uh, you know, in that whole thing, I'm not sure because it doesn't say, and so this is speculation, but I can picture Paul pressing the point a little bit, saying, guys, you know, saying what he said, I perceive the voyage will be injury, much loss of, of not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. And the centurion says, no, I don't think so. And Paul's like, okay. I don't think, I think he probably pushed back to the point that maybe the centurion said, prisoner, stand down. This is not your call. And, and putting Paul in his place, perhaps. But Paul said it, and then he just waited, and he did something else. He prayed, he interceded for that very bad decision that was being made, and continued to, he, he suffered the, the consequences of that. So, thinking they'd obtained their purpose, they pr raised the anchor, and they began sailing, and it was a wonderful, splendiferous day, close to the shore, but soon, a tempestuous wind called the Northeaster, um, Eurocladon, I believe it is, it sweeps down out of the north and just falls off those mountains and hit them with force, like our Taku winds. Man, I, I remember watching a uh, barge, I, we were living in Douglas at the time, and a barge was coming up the channel and the Taku winds were blowing. So the channel lays like this, we were here, and across um, on the other side of the mountains and the Taku winds just fall out of Canada onto us. And they cross those ridges sometimes over 200 miles an hour. But they they in town they're they're just crazy winds. They blow roofs off and stuff. So it was blowing across, and maybe it was blowing 70 knots or so, um, steady. Um, and this barge was coming up the channel, and pretty soon it was just tacking straight into the wind, and trying to make progress up the channel. And it sat there for oh probably an hour. Um, just tacking and tacking and trying to make some progress. And finally, they turned around and went back out because they could not make progress against this wind. Now, this is a sailing boat. It's not a powered boat. And they're coming along the island on this beautiful day. And the wind just drops off of that and hammers them. And to the point that the one place they didn't want to lose was that island. They're driven away and they have to let themselves be driven away. And so when the ship was caught and could not face the wind, we gave way to it and were driven along. Running under the lee of a small island called Kata, they got in the, the downwind side of it long enough that verse 2, or um, verse 16 continuing, we managed with difficulty to secure the ship's boat after hoisting it up. So they brought that uh, skiff onto the boat. Of course, that's the only way on and off of the ship. 
Um, they bring that onto the boat. They used supports to undergird the ship. This was a, a way of preparing, keeping a wood ship from blowing apart in the storm as they'd run ropes around, tighten them up, and, and just put an external extra strength on it just so that it wouldn't be losing boards. You lose a board in the deep, in the, you know, down in the, in the uh, transom or deeper in the, on the keel and the boat goes down quite easily. So they, they undergird it, they tie it together, and then fearing that they would run aground on the Sirtis, that was an extended bank of sands that were deep enough that you couldn't make it to shore, but shallow enough a boat could get stuck on it off the coast of Africa. And they were afraid of this. They lowered the gear and take their, all the cells and everything down and, and probably means they put in a sea anchor so that they're only traveling at the speed of the current, you know, or, or slows them down so the wind isn't driving them so fast. And thus they were driven along. Uh, verse 18, forgive me if you are a sailor or a boat person, um, this is your experience, so you don't need to explain, but uh, some people aren't, and so we're talking to those, as well as to each other. It's interesting to see others in the same kind of dilemma, right? And so uh, they put supports on the ship, then fearing they would run aground on the Sirtis, they lowered the gear, and thus we were driven along. And bottom line is they started out under their own power, under their own will, making a decision against Paul's better judgment, or Paul's call, um, based on good judgment, skill, a knowledge of the weather, and a better situation, even though in the weather seemed to in, uh, cooperate with it. And in a few moments, they find themselves actually out of control and simply being driven along. And, uh, you know, you can make a picture of this. The Bible says the way of the sinner is difficult. The way of the, the transgressor is hard. It's hard to go against good counsel, even though it may not appear at first. So they went against the counsel of God through Paul. And Paul, who is Paul? Why should they even believe anything Paul says? They don't know Paul. They just heard stories, perhaps. Uh, and But now they're going to learn. Um, and so they were driven along. Since we were violently storm-tossed, they began the next day to jettison the cargo. So now they're starting to throw gear over. Everything's gone. On the third day, they threw the ship's tackle, the stuff that enables them to have some uh, some room uh, for uh, use of different equipment or equipment breakers. They're throwing all everything overboard uh, with their own hands. And when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and notice this, no small tempest. It wasn't a, you know, it wasn't just difficult seas. It wasn't just a tempest. It was no small tempest. On the measure of the scale of tempest, this was a large one, he's saying. And it was large, and it was lasting. It was durable for a long time. And when neither sun or stars appeared and no small tempest laid up on us, all hope of being saved was at last abandoned. And this is where you get, right? You leave the harbor, and you... Avoid. You don't look at the guy standing on the coast as you're leaving with the sign that says "Abandon Hope, All Who Exit Here." Um, you're like, "Oh, don't look there." But there's, you know, signs sometimes along the way. But you leave, and then the storm hits, and pretty soon it's and everything changes. All the priorities. The priority when they left was just to get the ship to a safe spot where they could save the boat and be a little more comfortable until they took all that grain to harbor or to, to Rome for a big uh, return on their money. And now everything has changed. The value of things is very different. Storms have the capacity to do that in our lives, right? We re-evaluate. I think a lot of people have re-evaluated what's important. Sadly, church is no longer important to them. And they show that by voting with their feet. Even if you ask them, they say, oh, no, I'm still part of that church. In reality, they vote by not showing up. Or showing up very on a, very occasionally, and you know, of course, there's other stuff. I'm going down a rabbit trail, but storms happen and stuff changes in the storm. Priorities get shuffled um, that you never thought that that would be unimportant to you. But on the scale of things, the ship, the tackle, the the extra baggage, everything is negotiable if I can exchange it for a few more minutes of breath, and so. 
<clears throat> the sun didn't appear, and finally they abandoned hope, and all hope of being saved was at last abandoned. That's a, uh, it's a hard place, right, when, when in life you come to those kind of places where the hope is lost. But it's a good place. Because now you can begin to listen to sound wisdom. And look at what happens here. Since they had been without food for a long time, Paul stood up among them and he said, Men, you should have listened to me and not set sail from Crete and incurred this injury or loss. Now it's interesting, that word for listen, it means to submit to an authority or come under obedience to a king. It's interesting, Paul would say this. He's very bold. He's like, guys, what I said quietly, I said authoritatively. You don't get the privilege of second-guessing or redefining what God says to you. When God speaks, it's to be obeyed, whether it's a whisper or a loud voice. And so God has spoke, and you should have listened to me. And now is a second chance. And this is beautiful how this unfolds. You should have listened to me and not set sail from Crete and incurred this injury and loss. Yet now I urge you to take heart. So the first thing Paul does is he gives them a correction. He says, guys, think about the situation you're in right now. This is because you went against God's advice for you. You're like, well, we didn't know who you were. We didn't know if we could trust you. We could trust. It doesn't matter. God spoke and God's always good for his word. God's word is always true. Let God be true and every man a liar. I don't care what's being whispered in your ear elsewhere and all the flattering things that are being said about you. God, let God be true and let every man a liar. He begins with a correction. He says, listen, you should have listened and not set sail from Crete and incurred this loss. But now, secondly, I urge you, take heart, you guys. Now that you should have, things would have been very different if you'd listened. But this is going to be amazing because this is a story to write about. And here's the story. He says, I urge you to take heart for there will be no loss of life. Now that's something worth taking heart about if the whole boat, but did they yet believe him? It's still going to be discovered because you'll find that even within this, they're still fighting against their own will, against God's will. But he says, um, there won't be loss of life, but only the ship. So you're going to lose this, lose this ship. This is a, was a big priority, but it's going to be lost, but your lives will be saved. For this very night, this is encouraging. This is his encouragement. Why should I not be afraid? Is listen, because something happened to me tonight. The angel of God came and stood with me. Now that is a lovely statement to know that no matter where you are, God is with you. Emmanuel, God with us. And that would be heartening for these men on this boat who had been 14 days and night just going crazy with this storm never ending always at fear for their lives. And then God stands with them. To know that God was standing there on the boat would be amazingly heartening. And remember, Paul wasn't like immune from the up and down of the waves. He was experiencing this right alongside him. I think sometimes God puts strong believers in stormy situations right alongside unbelievers so that they can be give them hope and pray, pray them through, give them guidance. And so, he said um, that uh, the angel appeared. He said, um, don't be afraid, Paul. This is the message. So the presence itself would be incredibly encouraging. The second thing is the message he brings is, Paul, don't be afraid. You're going to go to Rome and stand before Caesar. All right, check box one. I'm saved. But Lord, what about all the people traveling with me? I'm concerned about their salvation. I've gotten to know a few of these along the way. What about their safety and their lives? He said, don't be afraid, Paul. You will stand before Caesar. And behold, God has granted you. Who is the gift to? The gift was to Paul. Paul had prayed for these. And Paul, God says, Paul, I'm going to grant your prayer. And I'm going to give to you all those who sail with you. Paul, the evangelist, always concerned about people always concerned about this, his audience and their lostness and their need to be saved. And Paul's saying, God, please, not on my watch. 
because although they think he's, he may think he's the captain, he may think he's the owner, he may think he's the centir, the one who holds me in chains, God, I am answerable to you, and you've put me in charge of these people. Please, God, don't let one soul be lost. And God says, Paul, you're going to get to your destination, and not one person on this boat is going to be lost. And um, so he final he says, he concludes it. Listen, you guys, take heart, man. I have faith in God. It's going to be exactly as I've been told. I know God. I've known him long enough to know that when he speaks, he does what he says. Take heart, man. God is going to do exactly as he said. And But, he says, we must run aground on Samaya, which means, of course, the loss of the ship. He's saying, basically, he's telling them beforehand, guys, the ship's going to be lost, but not one of you will die. 276 people that will be on this boat, boat, not one will die. And so when the 14th night had come, as we were being driven across the Adriatic Sea about midnight, um, the sailors suspected that they were nearing the land. There's that, that premonition, that sense of something there. How do they know that? We don't know. They just know the feel of the sea, and they know when something's changed. And they had a sense that something was different. And so they suspected they were nearing land. They took a sounding, and it was 20 fathoms. Okay, so that's 60, what would that be, 120 feet deep? Is that deep? I don't know. I don't know what deep is in that ocean, but, it's, but they're going to measure again a little farther on. They took a sounding and found it now 15 fathoms. So it's, it's coming up. It's just come up to 90 feet in just a little ways. And so they know that the bottom is coming up, and they're freaking out. And so fearing that we would run on the rocks, they let down four anchors from the stern, the back of the boat, and they prayed for the day to come. So like the worst thing possible, if we're going to shipwreck, can we shipwreck in the middle of day, please? Please not at midnight where we can't see a thing and it's, it's horrifying. And so they pray, they put down the anchors to try and keep it from, and remember there's still a tempest, it's still blowing crazy and they're having a hard time controlling it. Um, and um, they set the anchors and prayed for day to come. And as the sailors were seeking to escape from the ship, now see, this is, another, this is one of those things that arise in difficulties where you see the caliber of a person. What would happen if every sailor and the captain, these guys leave the ship, even all the sailors? The boat would be not dead in the water, it would be without guidance system no control, and they would have certainly just been smashed to pieces on the rocks. And so these guys are only thinking of themselves. they like, we can get off the boat, they can't, sayonara. And so they're lowering the boat to leave, and uh, the sailors were seeking an escape from the ship, and they lowered the ship's boat into the sea under the pretense of putting out some anchors from the bow. And Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, uh, and now, now you get a sense of who's in charge of this boat. Unless these men stay in the ship, you can't be saved. And the soldiers knew who was in command. They cut the ropes away of the ship, uh, the ship's boat, and they let it go. Now as day was about to dawn, now Paul, firmly in control, stands up and he says to them, uh, urge them to all take some food, saying, Today is the 14th day that you've continued in suspense, and without food, having taken nothing. You know, books are written. You know, people tell stories about one day or two days or three days in a storm. But this 14 days, that just kind of nibbles into your soul. And life can do that to us too, right? Children of Israel left Egypt. They were all like, you know, high-fiving, you know, the, and, and just, you know, fists in the air. God had given them great victory crossing the Dead Sea. the sea, And within 40 days, they were out, you know, close off partying, worshiping a false god. Things change because they thought Moses was dead. They thought they were directionless. And, and it's amazing how things changed for them. He says, but it's the 14th day. You've continued in this suspense without food and haven't eaten anything. You know, when even food loses its appeal, that's an indicator, isn't it, right, that something's going on. Either it loses its appeal or it gains more appeal. And you're just like, ah, yeah, binge eating. Well, that says something's wrong, too. But they hadn't eaten for 14 days, and so they're not only 
freaked out, they're, they're weakened considerably. And he says, 14th day you've continued and without food, haven't taken anything. Verse 34, therefore I urge you to take some food, guys. Eat something. It'll give you strength. Why? Because not a hair is to perish from the head of any of you. And, and I want you strong. You're going to have to swim to shore. I want you guys strong. I want my troops strong to the soldiers, to the sailors, to the prisoners. Let's strengthen ourselves. Everybody get something to eat. And then as an example, I love this. He's right in front of them. He says these things. And then when he said this, he took some bread. He thanked God for it in the presence of them all. Thank you, God, for this bread. Thank you that we get to eat again tomorrow. There will be a tomorrow. <laughs> this is not the end of life. This is only a part of it, a great story, but tomorrow we'll eat again together on the beach. Thank you, God. Thank you for this bread. He takes the bread, and in the presence of them all, he broke it and began to eat. And they all, listen to this, were encouraged and ate some food themselves. They had a leader. They had the encouragement that God was with them. They had the encouragement that they would all make it out of here. Now, for the ones that could swim, their hope might be a little higher. For the ones that couldn't swim, that would be a frightening, frightening thing. And yet they all were going to make it out alive. And he ate some food uh, in front of them, and they were encouraged and ate some food themselves. We were, in all, 276 prisoners. Some manuscripts say uh, 76 or so. But there's a large number. And, um, and when they had eaten enough, so everyone gorged out as much as they could. Then they lightened the ship, throwing out even their food into the sea. Everything. Everything now so the ship was as light as possible. And when it was day, they did not recognize the land, but they noticed a bay with a beach on which they planned, if possible, to run the ship ashore. They're hoping just a soft beach they can run in. Boom, it's good. Then they can save the ship. They can, they'd be okay. Um, that was their hope. So hoisting uh, the foresail to the wind, they made for the beach. I'm sorry, so they cast off the anchors and left them in the sea, and at the same time, loosening the ropes that tied the rudders, then they hoisted the foresail to the wind. So now we're going under, not under the control of the captain or the pilot anymore, but just under the control of the wind pulling us on shore. Um, they made for the beach, but striking a reef, they ran the vessel aground. The bow stuck and remained immovable, and the stern was being broken up by the surf. The soldier's plan was to kill the prisoners, lest any of them should swim away and escape. And that was because they had the responsibility, if any of them did escape, they would take their sentence. It was just the justice was, if you're a guard, then you must truly guard them with your life. And if they escape, if they're a murderer, it's your life for their life. And so they're like, let's not take chances, kill them all, let's get to shore. And so that was their plan, lest any should swim away. But the centurion, wishing to save Paul, kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could, uh, who could swim, to jump overboard first and make for the land. And the rest, he said, on planks or pieces of the ship. And so it was that everyone came safely to land. We were talking about this uh, earlier this week, and I was wondering uh, if Paul knew how to swim or not, um, because it says he he says himself he'd been shipwrecked three times. Um, so come to think of it, this may well have been his fourth time. I'd have to look at that um, from when he said that. But at any rate, <laughs> spending a night and day in the deep, you wonder if he might have learned a little bit of something about treading water if he didn't already know. <clears throat> and so it was, we were all brought safely to the land. And then chapter 28, after we were brought safely through, we then learned that the island was called Malta. The native people there showed us unusual kindness. Um, they kindled a fire, they welcomed us all because it had begun to rain and it was cold. And so people were coming ashore wet, cold, they kindled a fire, a big bonfire. And uh, when Paul had helped by gathering a bundle of sticks and put them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened on to his hand. So the native people saw the creature hanging from his hand, and they said to one another, No doubt this man is a murderer, and though he's escaped from the sea, justice has not allowed him to live. The fact is, Paul was a murderer. He'd killed Christians, but it wasn't justice that he was basing his life on, but mercy. 
and grace. The grace of God to him, a sinner. Um, grace, grace. And so they were looking at the result of justice, and they saw justice in the way that he would die in just a minute because they knew the snake, right? Um, he's a murderer, though he's escaped from the sea. Justice has not allowed him to live. He, Paul, shook off the creature into the fire and suffered no harm. And so they're standing around waiting for him to swell up or suddenly fall down dead. But when they had waited a long time and saw no misfortune come to him, then they changed their minds and said he was a god. How fickle the praise of men is, right? Or the, the, the denunciation or the, of men, right? Men decry you. And then in a minute that can turn around. Just don't trust it either way, right? And so um, they changed their mind and said he was a god. Now in the neighborhood of that place were lands uh, belonging to the chief man on the island named Publius. And uh, he received us and entertained us hospitably for three days. That's a pretty, uh, a pretty generous commitment to house and feed that many people for that long. And it happened that the father, his father, uh, the father of Publius, Publius lay sick with fever and dysentery, debilitating and, and deadly, potentially. Uh, probably could have died from this. And Paul visited him and prayed. And putting his hands on him, he healed him. When that had taken place, word got out. And Paul, remember, Paul came on the island. He came onto the boat, a prisoner. He swam ashore, the leader of the whole band. And now God continues to use him. And, and I see God do this with Christians. No matter your circumstances or difficulty, if you turn to the Lord, trust in him, repent of sins, forsake that, press into God, in the midst of it, God will use you, even in the midst of a storm. Even in the midst of a storm of your own causing, God is faithful. And so um, then uh, the native people, they see him, they think he's a god. He heals this man's uh, father, publishes his father, and then the rest of the people on the island who had diseases came, and they were cured also. So their response was, they honored us greatly. And when we were about to sail, they put on board whatever we needed. They, Paul now is being sent away a hero, um, and, and Luke and the, the followers of Christ. And, and what incredible uh, respect even the centurion would have for Paul after this. And, uh, you know, God sees things one way, man sees things another. Man sees, you know, who are, the, who are the high, who are the rich, who are the wealthy, who are the leaders. And, and we line ourselves up accordingly, but God looks very differently. He looks at the poor and the weak and the humble and the ones that he speaks to. And sometimes he crosses the bridge and he has one of those humble people speak to the highest of the high, and they listen. And Paul gets on the boat again with the entourage, the prisoners and all, and they put on board the people of the island, whatever we needed. So, um, and that happened, verse 11, after three months. After three months, we set sail in a ship that had wintered in the islands. Uh, it was a ship of Alexandria. Uh, with the twin gods as a figurehead. Listen, it doesn't matter how many gods you put on the head of the boat. Everyone on this boat now knew that they were not safe no matter who, unless it was the living God. And then the God of Paul. The God of Paul gets through anything. These two, Castor and Pollux, the twin gods, no, nah, not so much. And so um, from there, putting uh, in at Syracuse, we stayed there for three days. So they just made that jump up to uh, Italy then. From there, we made a circuit and arrived at right Regium. And after one day, uh, there was a south wind. And on the second day, we came to Putioli. And there we found brothers and were invited to stay with them for seven days. What a sweet, sweet reunion of sorts um, to find believers. And, and who probably were, could have very well been a product of Paul's ministry um, down the road um, in one way or the other. And so uh, they, we found these brothers and sisters, and they invited us to stay with them for seven days. And so we came to Rome, and the brothers there, when they heard about us, came as far as the Forum of Appius and three taverns to meet us. So word got out that Paul was on the way, and people were eager to see him and welcome him on in. And then on seeing them, Paul thanked God, took courage, 
And when he came into Rome, Paul was allowed to stay by himself with the soldier as a guard. So he has his own bodyguard in a sense. They think they're keeping him from escaping, but he knows that they're keeping him from being uh, harassed by anybody that uh, might not like the gospel. <clears throat> After three days of being in his own rented place, um, he called together the local leaders of the Jews. Paul just doesn't stop. And when they had uh, gathered, he said to them, Brothers, though I've done nothing against our people or the customs of our people, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. When they had examined me, they wished to set me at liberty because there was no reason for the death penalty in my case. But because the Jews objected, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar, though I had no charge to bring against my nation. And it's for this reason, therefore, I have asked to see you and speak with you, since it's because of the hope of Israel that I'm wearing this chain. Paul says, I'm in prison. It wasn't a fair thing. The Jews back there are not happy with me. But I need to tell you that it's the hope that we share, that all of us have been looking for. I found him, and I can tell you who he is. And so it was that hope um, that... Uh, that has put me here. And so the, uh, I lost my place. Verse 20, For this reason, therefore, I have asked to see you and speak with you, since it's because of this hope of Israel that I'm wearing this chain. And they said, We have received no letters from Judea about you, and none of the brothers coming here has reported or spoken any evil about you. So word didn't get, didn't get out, probably because they were protecting their backs. They didn't want to show up and end up with the brunt of, Caesar's anger because they had sent this man or caused this man to have to appeal here. Anyhow, nothing got out. They didn't know it. Um, these Jewish uh, believer or Jewish people there. And um, so, but we desire, they said, to hear from you what your views are. For as far as the sect goes, we know that everywhere it's spoken against. So they appointed a day for him and they came to him at his lodging in great numbers, in greater numbers. From morning till evening, he expounded to them testifying to the kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus from the law of Moses and from prophets and prophets. And some were convinced by what he said, but there were others who refused to believe. They disbelieved and disagreeing among themselves. They departed after Paul had made one statement. He said this, the Holy Spirit was right in saying to your fathers through Isaiah, the prophet, here's what Isaiah said, go to this people and say, you will indeed hear but never understand. And you will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and turn, and I, this is a promise, I would heal them. He said that blindness, that turning away, prevents God from answering. But turning to them, if their eyes would be open if they would hear, if they would understand, I'd turn and I would heal them. I'd change everything for them. Verse 28, 29, 30, 31. End of the chapter, end of the book of Acts. Therefore, Paul says, let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles and they will listen. Paul says there is a people gr group that will listen and this may hurt you and offend you deeply as we know it did make them incredibly angry and opposed to him. But he said, I'm taking, God is taking the message away from you for this time, and he's going to give it to the Gentiles. Again, in Romans, it talks about that. It talks about how God has cut them out of the native vine. The Jews were part of this vine, and God cut them off so that he could graft in Gentiles to it. But he said, you guys be careful, though. Don't get arrogant about this, because it's the vine, it's the, the roots that support you, not vice versa. And God is able to cut that unnatural you out of the vine, you as a, the Gentile people, and graft back in his own people, the Jewish people. He's talking about the, the people group themselves. But um, he says, let it be known that the salvation has been sent to the Gentiles and they will listen. And so verse 30, he lived there two whole years at his own expense, his own rented uh, place, and he welcomed everyone who came to them, proclaiming the kingdom of God, teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness, without hindrance. Nothing stopped except now people had to come to Paul. Paul couldn't go to them. And they came, and he did what he'd always done, is he preached the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
And we don't know what happened from there. Paul would have gone before uh, Nero at some point, and at some point, whether it's this time or another imprisonment, Paul was actually martyred. Um, he is said to have been beheaded um, for the gospel. So that ends the book. Incredible. I like the way this ends, just talking about Paul and just kind of getting that snapshot of his life. He's a great man, but the beauty is, you guys, is that no matter who you are, I believe that God wants to use you and use you powerfully. And he does that as you trust him, that he really does want to speak into people's lives. That person, you know, look for an opportunity. But learning to listen to the Lord is also important. Paul said what he said on the boat, and then he was silent. As far as we know, nothing was said. As they sailed away, as they got in the storm, as things got crazy, and then Paul speaks up, and, and he, he speaks. But, but knowing how to speak and when to speak is important. Um, anyhow, God has a plan for you. God wants to use you. And if you're in a storm right now, uh, trust him to get you through it. Psalm 107 is a great psalm to read uh, in regards to that. It gives four different conditions in life. You know, rebels, prisoners, sick people, people just going about life's business, doing merchandise on the seas and how God um, provides. And he asks for a response in each of those situations. He expects a response when he delivers. So Father, thank you for the word of God. Thank you for the book of Acts. What a wonderful book. Thank you for the people that have been able to, to join us here live. And um, thank you for those that will be listening and um, are listening um, at some other time, Lord. Would you speak into lives? Lord, we believe also there may be someone who's never surrendered their life to you and or is in a place of, of lack of surrender at this point. Lord, right now with them we pray that prayer of repentance. Lord, forgive me. I want to turn away from the sin that's dragging me away from you, that's keeping me remote and isolated. Lord, I want to be in fellowship. I want brothers and sisters, but more than that, I want to know that I have peace with God. So God, forgive me. Come into my life cleanse me and thank you for allowing me to be a part of your family in jesus name amen those simple kinds of prayers that's what paul always pressed for is just a response you hear something now how are you going to respond to it how are you going to give yourself three steps if god spoke to you how do i respond to that thing that he said to me and then begin checking them off and uh, respond to him so god bless you guys next week um i think it's going to be Timothy. Um, we've been going through the Bible uh, more or less chronologically to the way it was written, the time it was written. C Timothy would have been written now while Paul is in Rome. So we'll probably go there next. So good talking with you. God bless you. Don't forget to share this so other people get it. See you guys next time.